Hello, welcome, great to see you. My name is Justin. Thanks for joining us uh, for this message. I also have some friends joining me for this message. They're gonna help liven up uh, our time together today. So let me introduce you to Leo the Lion. Wow, there we go. Hello, Leo, you stay there. Uh, we also have Dolores the Dolphin. Come on, Dolores. That was my dolphin impression, in case you were wondering. Zelda the Zebra. <gasps> Whoop. Oh, oh, I dropped you. Sorry, Zelda. You, you sit there, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. We also have Terence the Turtle. Here we go. And we have Carl the Chameleon. Come on, come on, come on, Carl. Little reference for you there. So, now, these guys are all friends. But occasionally, like all good friends, they do have their moments. They have their tiffs, they have their arguments, they have their moments where they bump heads. So, I want you to keep your eye on them during the message. Make sure they are behaving because, after all, it is nearly panto season. So, <laughs> if you shouted, oh no, it's not back at the camera there, splendid, splendid. So, if you had to choose one thing to measure the spiritual vitality of a church, what would you choose? If you had to look at one thing to see how spiritually alive and, and, and alive and vital a church is. What would it be? Would it be prayer life? Would it be the amount people know their Bibles? Would it be their generosity in giving? Would it be their worship culture? What, what would you choose if you had to choose one thing to give you an idea as to how this church is doing? In Matthew 18, Jesus makes us this incredible promise. Let me, uh, let me read it to you. Matthew 18, 18 to 20. He says this. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. It's a great little three verses, isn't it? And, and Jesus is echoing his words that he's already said to Peter uh, about the, the understanding, the authority and the spiritual power that we have. What we, what we bind up is bound up. What we loose is loosed. If we can agree, then Jesus will be amongst us. Us. In the Jewish language, uh, poetry is the repetition of thoughts rather than sounds. So uh, we would say roses are red, violets are blue, you're quite tasty and I want to eat you. Uh, that would be how poetry would work because the sounds are repeating. But, but in Jewish thoughts, it's when ideas repeat that you get this sense of poetry. So whenever you're reading the Bible, it's always worth looking out for things that appear to be repeating themselves or ideas that are coming back throughout a passage. And I think there's a little bit of that going on here. So if, if you look at the screens, if we put this scripture like this, uh, then we get, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, repetition, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So I think Jesus is repeating one idea four times. And it's this idea that what happens on earth is replicated or affects or has, a, has an impact on what's happening in the heavenlies, in the spiritual atmosphere. What happens in the physical has an impact on the spiritual. What you bind on earth, what you bind up, what you don't allow, what you say, no, we're not going to have this, is bound up in the spiritual atmosphere. What you loose, what you release, what you say, yeah, this is great, we'll let this go, you're letting it go in the spiritual atmosphere. If on earth two of you can agree, then the Father gets to work 
in heaven. And if two or three can gather together, where are they gathering? They're gathering on earth. Then Jesus says, I'll come from heaven and be among them. So you've got this repetition. What you guys do on earth not only affects the heavenly, the spiritual atmosphere that you live in, but it actually has the power to bring heaven down to earth by Jesus' presence among you. We set the atmosphere. Heaven gets busy and then heaven comes to earth by what we do together on earth. But, but when Jesus says, when you agree, it's, 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 it's a bit different to kind of, I don't know, Carl saying, hey, let's get pizza. And Zelda says, yeah, that sounds all right. I'll go for pizza. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that. It's more this idea of symphony, like an orchestra. 80 to 100 musicians all playing different instruments, all playing different notes, but yet playing in such a way that it blends together to create a beautiful, harmonious, symphonic, synergy sound where they're all working together. It's not just a light agreement, it's a deep unity of everybody bringing their difference together to make something beautiful. Again, when Jesus says where two or three are gathered, it's not like just, well, okay, we're all lying together on this table, so boom, Jesus has to come. It's more about getting together in the same direction. The largest rowing boat in the world, uh, sports boat, has 24 places and a coxswain. I think that's how you say it. Imagine the power, 24 people rowing all at the same time, the power and the strength that they can put into the water to propel that boat going forward, all pulling in the same direction at the same time with the same goal. But then imagine the chaos if one of them just starts getting out of sync, starts wibbling the oars around, starts trying to go in the other direction. When they are lined up in unity, they can charge ahead. If somebody breaks rank, things start to fall apart. And Jesus is trying to get his followers and us to understand the, the power that's in our hands, how we can impact the spiritual atmosphere that we live in, how we can pull heaven down to earth by the way that we deal with things, by the way that we are with each other. So what do we need to do in order to achieve this? Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Fight Club. Welcome to Fight Club, the 1999 Brad Pitt film, which if you have watched like me, you probably shouldn't admit to having watched it in church. I, I did watch it, but I, I can't really remember much about it, but I think it's two kind of middle-aged, slightly bored gentlemen have a fight in a car park one day, decide, oh, this is better than, I don't know, going to the office or doing the dishwasher. Uh, so they start a club where other disenfranchised board men can get together and punch the life out of each other and they kind of get a bit of a kick off that and that seems to uh, help them. I'm sure the plot is more nuanced than that, but that's kind of all I can remember. But the rule about Fight Club is you don't talk about Fight Club. I wonder what your style of conflict is is. I wonder when it comes to fights, when it comes to falling out with people, when it comes to us hitting difficulties with each other, how do you like to handle that? You know, the kind of standard old kind of analogy for this is the hedgehog or the rhino. I am a hedgehog married to a rhino. Uh, so Liz, my wife, in her conflict style is very loud, is very aggressive, is very quick. It's kind of bang, 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 bang. I am a hedgehog, I go very quiet, I go very sulky, I go very prickly, I don't like to engage, I just like to throw sharp comments every now and again. I, I once hedgehogged for three days straight. But there's a slightly more intelligent model called the Thomas Kilman Conflict Mode Instrument, or the TKI for short which Thomas, you've missed a trick. It should be the TKO, but anyway, I'll leave that with you to sort out. So I wonder if you recognize yourself in this. So the first style that Thomas has identified is, it's a bit like a turtle, it's the avoid. 
similar to the hedgehog, we see conflict coming, we don't like it, so we pop our heads in our shells, out we come, no one can get in at us, we're not engaging, there's not a fight happening, we're not doing conflict, no, 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 la, 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 it's not happening, we avoid it at all costs. Then, then there is the lion, the competing, the rah, I am king of this savannah and I am going to win and I am going to eat you all up. I am going to compete and make sure that I am the last one standing. Then there's the chameleon, which is just, I will just give in. I'll just agree with you. I will change myself to fit in with you. The only problem is the chameleon will also then change themselves to fit in with the next person that they speak to about this and the next person that they speak to about this. And then if all of those people get in the same room, the chameleon's got a little bit of a problem because it doesn't like conflict, so we'll just agree so that it seems like we're on the same side, even if actually he doesn't agree. Maybe you're more like Zelda, the zebra. Hey Zelda, how you doing? Uh, zebra, it's kind of half and half. It's a bit of a compromise. I'm not quite a horse, but I'm not quite a stripy animal. I'm something in the middle. So uh, let's try and find a way. You get a little bit of you, I get a little bit of me, and then everyone's happy. And then finally, Dolores the dolphin, just everybody wins. Let's find a way for me to get what I want, you to get what you want, and for us to live in a harmonious pod of dolphins splashing through the sea all happily. Let's find a way that we can all win together. I wonder which style of conflict you prefer. I wonder which animal you are most like. When somebody says, can I have a word with you? I wonder what your instinctive reaction is. And of course, you might have to choose different styles depending on the kind of conflict and the kind of safety that's around you and the situation that you're in. But it's worth being aware, how do we handle conflict? So, why are we talking about this? What on earth has this got to do with the spiritual vitality of the church and the passage that Jesus has uh, outline to us about what we do on earth affecting what happens in heaven. Well, let's go back to Matthew 18, but let me read a few more verses around the verses we've already looked at. Verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Then Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus says to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times times. I think one of the most important things for us as a community of believers when it comes to setting the spiritual atmosphere, I think one of the best ways to measure how mature we are as followers of Jesus and how mature we are as the people of God together, one of the key things that will determine the spiritual vitality of a church life is how do we deal with conflict? How do we deal with it when we fall out with each other, when we upset one another, when we offend one another, when we hurt each other? What do we do with that? Because what we do with that, Jesus says, will affect the spiritual atmosphere we live in. I think part of our problem in church is it's a bit like Fight Club, Let don't talk about Fight Club. 
we expect everyone to be nice and fluffy and to get on and everyone's oh just oh we're just so delicious and lovely and we love each other and it's all wonderful and we kind of lull ourselves into this false sense of security that everything's fluffy and nice and yet we know that actually as humans we're not always fluffy and nice heck i, I can fall out with myself in a room on my own i don't need anybody else to help me do that like we will conflict we will have moments where we, we butt up against one another. We will have moments of hurt and pain in our interpersonal relationships. We can't avoid it. It's part of being a fallen human. It will come. And Jesus isn't saying, don't fall out. He's saying, when you do, this is how you need to handle it. We need to talk about Fight Club. We need to normalize Fight Club. We need to accept that conflict will occur. That isn't a problem. It only becomes a problem in the way we handle it or don't handle it. So there's just a couple of things that I'm gonna pull from this passage, although Jesus gives us a lot more that you can dive into. But just a couple of things that I wanna pull out to help us think about conflict. And I hope by the end you can think about the kind of conflict style that you prefer, maybe where you might need to develop and kind of grow and mature. And then a couple of things to think about next time you find yourself edging towards a difficult moment with somebody else. First thing that Jesus says, the goal of conflict is to win. Okay, the goal is to win. Jesus talks about it, you need to win. But what is it that you're trying to win? See, Jesus doesn't say, when you go to your brother and confront him, if he listens, then you've won the argument. No, he says, you've won the brother. You've won your sister. You've won the relationship. And when we fall out with one another, when we need to conflict, when we need to go, hey, can we talk about this? Because this is causing me an issue. If we go in with the goal is I want to win, I need to get my point across and I need to be proved as the one in the right, we're setting ourselves up for an issue. But if we go in going, the goal of this conversation is for us to win our relationship, is for us to strengthen our relationship, that actually this is going to be a difficult conversation now, but the back end of it, we're both going to win a deeper relationship. Even if we still disagree, even if we don't fully see each other's point, the idea is we win the friendship, we win the relationship. There's this idea in kind of relational with psychology theory called rupture and repair. And often it's centered around parent and child that there's a rupture in the relationship. There's a fallout, there's a blowout, there's an explosion. Somebody missteps and now we find we're butting up against each other. And you know, the rupture isn't the problem. It's the repair that makes the difference. If you can rupture, but then repair well, your relationship comes out stronger. You know, you find yourself saying, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I can see what I've said has been really hurtful to you. And actually, I really like you and I don't want to hurt you. And I want our relationship to be good, but I do need to talk about this. Help me talk about it in a more helpful way for you. See, if the goal is to win, if the goal is to repair the relationship, then the relationship can come back stronger after the conflict, even stronger than it was before the conflict. As long as you go into it, the goal is to win the relationship, not to win my point, not to win my pride, not to win my ego. I think if we just accepted that conflict will come and we accept that actually it doesn't have to be a bad thing, it can end up as a really, really positive thing, and we own our style, so we own our own insecurities and difficulties and we're aware of that, we are setting ourselves up for healthy, stronger relationships. And what we do on earth with each other, how we treat each other, how we approach conflict affects the spiritual atmosphere that we live in. So the goal is to win the relationship. Number two, 
we have to address things head on. Jesus in this passage, he, he's calling it out, isn't it? He? He's saying, listen, if, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. He's saying, don't sweep it under the carpet. Don't, don't talk to everybody else. Don't just pretend it never happened. Take it on. When something goes wrong in a relationship, take it on and deal with it. Go to him and chat about it. He's pulling a Jewish uh, law through from Leviticus 19.17, where it says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbour, lest you incur sin because of him. You know, there's a technical term for personalities like mine, and it's uh, cowards. Just don't like it. I don't like going and saying, hey, you've upset me. Heck, I don't even like saying in a restaurant, this isn't what I ordered. I'll just, oh no, no, this is lovely. I'll eat it up going, I didn't order this. This is completely different. I hate stepping into that moment of going, hey, can we talk about something? But the Jewish law that Jesus is bringing forward is plain. Listen, if you've got a problem, talk to somebody, talk to the person about it. Otherwise, their sin then becomes your sin. So you might not have started this issue, you might not have been the cause, but if you don't handle it properly, you will end up in sin yourself. So you have to go to them and together get it right. You see, if you don't, there's another technical term that, that the, the coward personality then becomes a gossip. Don't we? Because we're, we're afraid to tell the waiter that they've brought the wrong thing. But man, we'll tell everyone on our table and we'll tell social media and we'll tell all our friends and we'll talk about it repeatedly when we get back from a holiday from France like I did. When we refuse to address stuff head on, we find ourselves talking to everybody but the one person that we can resolve this with feels so delicious, doesn't it? To tell everybody else how bad someone's been to you. It feels really hard to go to that person alone and go, hey, help me. Can we strengthen our relationship? We need to talk about this. As the people of God, we would be radically different, radically different if we just did these things. If we saw conflict as an opportunity to improve our relationships, if we addressed it head on, and if we only talked to the people that could resolve it with us and nobody else. Renewal would be a different church in 12 months time if we committed to talking to one another when we need to, and we committed to holding each other to account. So when I try and talk to you about somebody else, you say, well, I can't help you. Have you spoken to them. Now Jesus does set out, doesn't he, how we escalate if we can't resolve things, how we move through bringing other people in and what their role is to try and help us. But 90% of our issues would be resolved if we just had open, honest conversations with each other and we would transform the spiritual atmosphere we live in. Renewal, we've got big vision, haven't we? From one to many. We've got big focuses. Let us start. Let us make a space where young people and the community can come in and we can see the church go from generation to generation until the Lord returns. In a time where the nation is in panic, we can be a beacon of hope and go, hey, heaven is on earth. Jesus is amongst us. We have got hope for you. But in order for us to do that well, we have got to do our relationships one to another well, and we have got to handle our conflict well. So ladies and gentlemen, let's enjoy Fight Club. Bless you. Thank you for joining us for our message. If there was something that resonated with you, or you want to explore a little bit more about Jesus, then go to renewalcc.com forward slash next steps. You can fill out the form there and we can connect with you. 
Also, if you have a question for the team or you just want to say hello, then you can get in contact with us at hello at renewalcc.com and one of the team will be in touch with you. Also, we want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can also go to renewalcc.com forward slash media where you can find our Spotify and Apple podcast channels where you can find all our messages and all our online content and there's a new episode being released every Monday. Finally, if you like the work that we do, you can also donate to Renault. If you go to renaultcc.com forward slash give, you can find all the ways in which you can give into the life of Renault. But thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.